think perhaps we should continue now if Professor Pepper is ready. He's uh, speaking to two topics today. We want to know, what, know what's new in mitral valve surgery as well. Could you please carry on for us, John? Okay, I'll see if I can do that. And of course, some patients need both operations, the root and the mitral valve, but I'm sure John will talk to that and tell us how the surgeons tackle that problem. Okay, so yes, the mitral valve in the Marfan syndrome. So uh, I, I'm going to start with basics. I, I, I don't want to treat, teach grandmothers how to suck eggs, but I think there are one or two things you need to know about the mitral valve. So the mitral valve sits between the main pumping chamber of the left ventricle and the left atrium, and that's the priming chamber into which all the oxygenated red blood comes from the lungs. So if the mitral valve leaks, then blood flows backwards into the lungs and the lungs then become full of fluid. So it's rather like your grandmother or maybe your great grandmother's sponge, which when dry is very light and you can bounce it in your hand. But after you put it in the bath, it's full of water. It's extremely heavy. And that's exactly what happens to the lungs if there's a bad leak from the mitral valve. It becomes very difficult to breathe. And if it goes on long enough, you may even uh, go into heart failure. Now, uh, the mitral valve itself, if you look at this little uh, cartoon on the right here, um, there is a, a, what, an, another annulus. We talked about the aortic annulus. This is another little ring. And because when the ventricle contracts, the pressure particularly if you're walking upstairs, could be 170, 160 millimeters of mercury. So to keep this valve uh, working, it needs strings, which we call cordy, strong strings or like ropes to make sure that the valve closes properly. And there are some conditions in which the valve uh, has weak strings, a condition known as mitral valve prolapse, very common, but also quite common in connective tissue disorders such as Muffam. Now we use the echo to uh, diagnose this, uh, and all of you will be very familiar with the echo. Mitral valve is rather like a parachute. Here you're sitting in here, and we can look at the, the saddle shape. It's not a straight, flat structure. It's a saddle shape. We can see leaflet misalignment, which may be difficult for you to see in these images, but if you look at the cartoon below, here you can see these leaflets are just not coming together. And here there's one uh, prolapsing backwards. And here there's a different leaflet prolapsing backwards. So echo helps us to uh, make those diagnoses. Now the incidence of mitral valve prolapse, forgetting Marfan for a moment, is quite uh, frequent, up to 2.4%. It's a bit more common than a bicuspid aortic valve, which is a 1% to 2%. But to look after the patients with this condition, we need expert imaging and evaluation and, and symptom management. Now, in the Marfan syndrome, uh, familial primary uh, mitral valve prolapse is itself an autosomal dominant trait. In other words, 50, if you have it, 50% of your um, children will have it. And it also includes uh, other inherited tissue disorders, such as uh, lower steeds. It's interesting, in children, the mitral valve is often more affected than the aorta or the aortic valve compared to adults. And the mitral annulus is larger than it should be, and it's also flatter. I mentioned that before. And th there is a, a, a greater billow volume leading to a leaking valve. I'll try and show you that in the next few pictures. So here's some rather nice pictures uh, using TomTech 4D analysis. And you can see the annulus of the aortic valve. You can see that uh, here, and you here you can see the leaflet parameters. So this is the posterior leaflet, this is the anterior leaflet of the aortic valve. So we now have fantastic technology to be able to study the, the uh, mitral valve. And that's what I mean by the billowing volume. You can see this is a computer reconstruction, and this is the, the, the billowing that has come through, through the valve. This is abnormal, this is normal. And just to uh, uh, lyrically indicate that next time you see someone or you see yourself with a Pringle, uh, it is really the shape of a mitral valve. Something to remember. 
So if we look at Marfan patients compared to patients who do not have Marfan, here is the billowing volume of a Marfan patient, and these are the controls. And you say there are two things that are happening. First of all, there's the billowing, and secondly, the mitral valve in control, you see, has this saddle shape, like the Pringle, whereas it's much flatter in the Marfan. So two major changes, and that's at the age of three. Now we look at the age of 14, it's a bit worse. There is more billowing, um, and compared to the control, much, much flatter. So these are the kind of uh, uh, studies that we do. If Neetha Nakvia is still on, she is extremely expert at this. Now, there have been a, a lot of uh, experimental work. There is, uh, uh, there is a, a mouse model, in fact, more than one mouse model, of uh, fibrillin deficiency, which produces a condition similar to, to Marfan. And if you look at the mitral valve architecture here, you just look at the top pictures here, um, here is uh, a normal uh, mitral valve, and here is a very abnormal mitral valve, with leaflets looking uh, really uh, uh, very strange indeed. And if you look at leaflet length in the, um, uh, in, in the Marfan model mouse, you have extremely long leaflets and they're also very thick. So all this has been studied. Hal Dietz is one of the high priests of uh, the science underlying Marfan and works at the um, Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital in, um, in Baltimore, United States. You probably have heard his name. If we look at the mitral valve in Lois Dietz and in Marfan, but just let's look at the Marfan syndrome. We, this is a, a series of patients, 19 with Lois Dietz and 28 with the Marfan syndrome. And just look, 29% uh, had an isolated anterior leaflet, 3% had a posterior leaflet, very, very small. But the majority, both leaflets are involved. Um, so that's different from Lois Dietz, where actually mostly it's the anterior leaflet. So in Marfan syndrome, both leaflets of the mitral valve are involved. And the anterior leaflet is a more complicated thing to repair than the posterior leaflet. Now, everyone has got a small series of these uh, uh, patients. But uh, my friend and colleague, Connell Austin at the Evelina Hospital, and we're very closely linked to the Evelina Hospital now at the Brompton. He's operated on four patients in the age range of 13 to 40, with one child aged 10. A variety of techniques have been used, but they've all come from the routine repair of mitral valve prolapse in adults. In the last 30 years, we've been repairing mitral valves in adults with increasingly better and better results. So now, the risk of the operation is less than 1%, and a good repair uh, should last for at least 15, 20 years or longer. And of course, because it's a repair, it doesn't require a new valve and all the problems associated with an artificial valve, which I mentioned in the previous talk. And the kind of uh, techniques, uh, you won't want to know everything, but the majority of people with mitral prolapse have a posterior leaflet repair, about 70%. And fortunately, that is the easiest thing to repair. But so people can uh, resect that and uh, get a good result. Or you can put artificial cordy in. They're made of Gore-Tex. And that's become very popular in the last 10 or 15 years. Or, controversially, you can turn the orifice into a double orifice, uh, rather like a pair of binoculars or a pair of spectacles. And this was invented by an Italian surgeon from Milan, called Alfieri. And in fact, this repair has led to the use of uh, mitra clip, a you know, minimal invasive way of doing it, um, which you're probably uh, familiar with. So these are techniques that have all been worked out in adults, and they can be applied to patients uh, with Marfan. So this is a sad picture of a patient with neonatal Marfan, a missense mutation in exon 25 of the fibrillin gene. And the cardiac diagnosis, root dilatation in this particular child, mitral valve prolapse with a severe leak, and also the tricuspid valve, which sits between the right ventricle and the right atrium, is also leaking. So three valves are in trouble, and 
the root is dilated. That's quite a lot to deal with at the age of a few months. So at 10 months, the baby uh, uh, underwent repair of the mitral and tricuspid valve. There were other things wrong as well with lens subluxation, severe scoliosis, and multiple joint laxity. And the, uh, he, re oh, sorry. he required uh, other procedures, spinal surgery, and emergency eye surgery for retinal detachment. And by the age of seven, the patient again had severe mitral regurgitation despite the repair at 10 months. Left atrium was very large, the left ventricle was enlarged, but it was still working well, which was a key point. And the aortic root was very dilated. So you might say, how was this seven year old getting on? Well, actually, he had a good quality of life. He was on Losartan and a beta blocker, attended full school full time and read all the Harry Potter books and traveled widely, even to Vietnam. And at this point, I must thank uh, Nitha Nakvi for this information, as, it, as, as it's her patient. And uh, she's allowed me to tell you about it. This is to give you an idea of the abnormality of the child, a severe scoliosis. So here's the chest X-ray, and here's the spine. You see, completely curved spine. And you can see how these sternal wires, this is in the sternum from the operation at the age of 10 months, are, should be lying over the spine. So it's a very abnormal um, chest X-ray. And yet this child uh, is an incredible example of how people can uh, deal with and overcome to a large extent disabilities. And this is an echo picture, which um, uh, just shows a, a, an abnormal mitral valve. I'll pass over that because it's not that clear if you're not used to looking at echoes. But this is the CT scan. So here is the aorta and here's the ascending aorta and this is the aortic root and you can see it's enormous, much bigger than it should be in a 10 year old. Very, very large indeed. So there are questions, questions to which we still really don't have answers. But there are questions very relevant to this child. What is the risk of dissection in a patient with neonatal Marfan syndrome, even some years later after the neonatal period. Does the risk of an operation exceed the risk of conservative treatment? And furthermore, at what size should the root be repaired and what type of repair? These are all questions to which there are not clear answers. You can't look it up in a textbook and be told exactly what to do. We are still working on the problem. So at the age of 10 and a half, this ch child had another operation, obviously a redo sternal operation, a complex mitral valve repair of both leaflets and a pairs procedure at the same time. I take the liberty of just showing you this short, very short video. This is Mr. Connell Austin, and that's the, the mitral valve. And then P1 is over here. So you can just see so that is there is excessive amount of tissue. Is over here. He is going to reduce it some of that tissue. And in the end, far too much he did that, leaflet. put in a ring, a ring around here, and uh, had so, an, an excellent here. result. Uh, here's the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Here's the aortic root before the operation. You remember that picture I showed you before? Look, it's enormous, okay? The blood is, the ventricle is here, blood is going this way into the aorta. And this is the situation uh, after the pairs, oh, sorry about this, after the pairs operation. So a marked change. Now, a minority of patients with Marpan present with a leaking mitral valve, but young patients do present with that and the question is, was it a good idea if they definitely have Marfan while you're repairing the mitral valve, uh, do a pairs procedure? And increasingly, we think it is a good idea because the pairs operation is safe. But the important thing to remember is you have, you need a surgeon who is very experienced with mitral valve repair because the mitral uh, problem is complex. And as I pointed out earlier, um, involves both leaflets. Thanks for your attention. I'm very happy to take some questions. Very, very much, John. Uh, so a lovely review for us. Victoria, do you have any questions from the audience? 
Victoria, any questions? You're muted. Sorry, that's, um, that's a ubiquitous problem. Um, <laughs> yes, um, someone wondered, so I'm just frantically scrolling, if there's any added risk for mitral valve repair surgery at the same time as pairs, um, their son's due to have this at the end of the year at the Freeman. Um, is That's, there an elevated risk? I think you probably answered this. Well, but. It's a difficult question to I'm, I'm not trying to be evasive, but it is a difficult question to answer. It depends on the individual patient, it depends how much comorbidity is there is. You know, if there are spinal problems um, uh, and a very abnormal chest, um, yes, there could be a slight increased risk. So if the risk, I mean, I think the whole risk is not going to be more than about 2%. It was going to be 1% or less for the mitral valve and 0.2% or around that figure for the pairs. I think the risk was about 2%, but it, it depends on the individual patient. Um, if the lungs are, are, are reasonable and the kidney function is normal, then those are the kind of risks. But if there's abnormality, then the risk will rise. So I can't give a, a really helpful generic figure, but it's of the order of around 2%. But I think you need to um, examine it in detail with, with the uh, doctors at the Freeman. Could I ask uh, whether the heart itself takes a long time to um, respond to your surgical corrections? Does it have to remold or reshape, especially the left ventricle? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Anne. In this particular patient that uh, was looked after by Neetha Nackby, um, this patient had had, had a, uh, at the age, by the age of 10, had had nine years of a leaking mitral valve, and the ventricle was very enlarged, but as I mentioned, uh, the systolic function, its ability to contract was still reasonably preserved. And uh, to my astonishment, because I don't do a, a pediatric surgery, six months, after six months, the left ventricle had remodeled and is now essentially normal. So the ability of the young heart, this would not happen in someone of my age, but in the young heart, the ability to remodel is absolutely amazing. Um, so uh, that child who has many other problems, but is still at, at regular school and enjoying life, uh, now has a normal left ventricle. So I think in young people, the ventricle is able to remodel. Excellent. Victoria, back to you. I think Guy Guy Potter has raised his hand and has a question. Right, Guy? Thank you. Oh. Uh, I think it's implied by, well, I've got two questions actually, so uh, forgive me. I think it's implied by your, by what your last response was that you mentioned that the mitral valve billowing or leakage happens much more, seems to be more prevalent in children. Correct. Than it manifests in adults. Does that mean the children with that billowing are not getting to adults, or does it mean the problem goes away somehow? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, not all billowing valves need to be repaired. Uh, I mean, you could have mild billowing and carry on with a perfectly normal life. But, uh, you know, the Marfan syndrome, uh, I'm, I'm talking purely about the Marfan syndrome, but children with the Marfan syndrome their, uh, their first presentation tends to be more often with the mitral valve than with the aorta. Okay. Yeah. Whereas someone presenting in their teenage years or the twenties or thirties, uh, the most common cardiovascular problem is, is the aorta. Right. And so, okay, I've got a follow on question from that. Sorry. Um, yeah. is that, does that, does it look like the, the trend is more towards the importance of getting diagnosis and therefore operating early? so that the heart itself can adapt to the, uh, it, the surgery. Um, just yes, as you're absolutely right. Early, di early and precise diagnosis is absolutely key because first of all, you need to be able to tell the patient and their parents, you know, what's going on, what's the prognosis, what's the future hold. And if you can get a repair done early, yeah. um, then yes, the heart can remodel yeah. and, uh, because we are pretty experienced with mitral valve repairs, we can usually expect to get at least a 20-year uh, um, good result, maybe longer, but 
we mm. don't have data that goes much longer than 20 years. Right, okay, yeah. And one final little thing that follows on from that is that um, in my stepfather's case, um, so what happened with him is that it seems like the mitral valve leakage or billowing has, has caused the heart failure. Right. Um, so he did manage late last year, I think he had the Alfieri type conversion. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, remarkable operation, minimally, it, so it was a minimally invasive one. Yes, it would be, um, yeah. But his heart failure basically, you know, just was too much by that stage. Uh, and so he died in February. But right. it sounds like there's a really important message about communication. So his, the, the, per, the cardiologist who was in charge of his Marfan's clinic wasn't really very aware of the latest techniques and where you might be able to get them done yeah and, well we all have to keep up to date and uh, uh, that's our responsibility as physicians yeah. but yeah. early diagnosis is the key doesn't right. mean you always have to intervene early but at least you need you must get an early and precise diagnosis yeah yeah i just when there's a communication um i don't know bottleneck possibly that can happen as well yeah, as, well you you just have to keep reading the journals yeah yeah <laughs> up to date yeah, sure, incumbent, sure. incumbent on all of us, you know. Yeah. On that theme, could I invite Darren McDean to ask a question? Darren, you're being very quiet today. <laughs> Darren had specific problems with his mitral valve. Um, he's now 50. I hope you don't mind my saying. And, 49. Uh, look, sorry, 49. That's okay. And no, of course, I, I, must, I must stress that the average... Uh, the average life expectancy in John's graph in 1972 was about 32, whereas now it's more about 68. It's certainly up in the normal range. And we want Darren to continue, and Darren wants to continue as long as he can. Um, but he's run into trouble with his mitral valve and had one unsuccessful operation. He's coming for another. Um, so obviously, uh, it is a tricky area. Darren, can you tell us more? Um, I had surgery in, um, 35 years ago, in 1985 at Harefield, to replace my aortic root and do repair on my aortic valve. Um, over the past four or five years, my, um, my mitral valve has now uh, got really that bad that it needs repairing. Um, I went to the Lancashire Cardiac Unit um, last year, I think it was now. Yes, last, last March to have a minimally invasive surgery to replace that valve. Um, but once they got me, um, they got in there. They, they, there was too much blood in the aorta and they couldn't see, so that had to be aborted. Um, now, 18 months on, um, it turns out that my aortic valve now needs replacing, which has lasted well, considering it was fixed 35 years ago. Um, and I'm having it done at the Brompton. I'm just waiting for a date, really. Um, but uh, regarding the question, um, is it common to have the two of them replaced together and then does it have a good outcome? No, it's not, it's not common. It's not rare, but uh, as the textbooks uh, unhelpfully say, it's not uncommon. Uh, but so it, it can happen, but um, it, it isn't a frequent operation. But, uh, you know, experienced surgeons are very familiar with doing redo surgery and replacing the aortic valve. And either it might be possible to do a further repair, um, but the likelihood is you probably would need a, a new mitral valve, but it might be possible to do another repair of the mitral valve. I'm just talking first principles, obviously, I don't know your details. No, and of course not. No, it's Mr. Rosendahl, obviously, works well, he's with himself. He's an experienced valve surgeon, so if yeah. you get another repair of that mitral valve, he will. Yeah, it's, it's not actually had and a repair of them. Sorry. And nowadays we do all these operations with transesophageal echo. So while you're asleep, asleep, a black tube has been put down your throat into your stomach. And on the end of that um, is the ceramic uh, 
uh, detector that uh, can allow us to take ultrasound pictures of your heart because the gullet lies immediately behind the heart. So we get much better pictures than you do with a probe on the front of the heart. So with that equipment, we are able to know exactly how good the repair of the mitral valve is before we let the patient out of the operating room. So the quality control nowadays is much better than it was 20, 30 years ago. Thank, thank you. you. Can we end on that most hopeful note and thank Professor Pepper for giving up his Saturday morning to help us out. <laughs>